Today, we'll uh, move over to the negative side. Um, so I'm talking about negative strand RNA viruses as opposed to the positive strand RNA viruses that we've talked about so far. Um, but first, we need to do review, which of course means clicker questions. Um, so <clears throat> first one for today, the SARS coronavirus is most closely related to hepatitis C virus, camel coronavirus, mouse hepatitis virus, bat coronaviruses, human coronaviruses that cause a common cold. Ten. Sorry, it jumped away a second ago. <clears throat> Pardon? <laughs> if you like, I could try. <laughs> Jeopardy music, something like that. Uh, yeah. We'll have to see, but probably if I did Jeopardy music and tried to post it on YouTube, then I would get this thing that popped up and said, well, you're using copyrighted stuff. You're not allowed to do that. So uh, be that as it may. So <clears throat> uh, most people like bat coronaviruses. What would it be if I'd put MERS up here? Camels, Camels exactly. Uh, mouse hepatitis virus. It's a really nice model for the coronaviruses. It's actually really quite closely related to this one down here, the human coronaviruses that are causing the common cold, which is one reason why lots of people use the mouse hepatitis virus as a nice model system for this. Hepatitis C, related to this in any way, shape, or form? Well, yes and no, um, because if you think about the actual genes that are important for replication, it being another positive strand, you know, RNA virus, it could be. But in terms of the molecular relatedness, it's way out there, um, relatively speaking. So yes, um, it is D, um, the bat coronaviruses, although there are also a number of bat coronaviruses that are very closely related to basically every single one of these things with the exception of, of hepatitis C. So there are um, probably, at least as far as we've looked, the most diversity in coronaviruses is in these bat coronaviruses. Um, potentially, it's because that's where we've been looking based on SARS, but that's another whole story. Um, so <clears throat> coronaviruses are unique among the viruses that we've discussed so far in that they encode a polyprotein, have a five prime cap, have a three prime poly A tail, encode proteases, or use peptidase receptors.
And now it's the do 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 thing I need to start singing. <laughs> and probably if it's singing, it'll be so bad that the pattern recognition software won't get it. So, <laughs> so what do we think? A um, little bit more of a difference of opinion here. Uh, encode a polyprotein, do they? Yes, they definitely encode a polyprotein. Do other viruses we talked about encode polyproteins? Yes, definitely. A five prime cap. Does it? Yes. Any other viruses we talked about with five prime caps? Yes. A number of other ones. Three prime poly tail. Yes. So what? Are, by the way, let's back up a little bit. Which ones have five prime cap? The flaviviruses. Three prime poly tail. Pico RNA viruses. Exactly. Encode proteases. Yeah. Well, anything that's got a polyprotein basically is encoding a protease. And so, just by process of elimination, you could get this one down here at the bottom. But um, the peptidase receptors or the protease receptors, which probably don't require that protease activity in terms of <coughs> um, their actual activity. So it is using the peptidase receptors. Last thicker question for today um, about <coughs> what is the death rate in known cases of SARS? 0 0.1, 1, 5, 10, or 50? You shouldn't need a calculator for it. <laughs> should not. <laughs> if you do, you should be taking my daughter's math class. I want four decimal points, please. So, okay, yeah, we'll see what we can do here. So, um, I did hear again some mutterings about this. Um, if that had been MERS, what would it be? About 50%. Um, one of the, what's probably, I think, the most important word in this whole question? Well, no, that's, well, that's okay. About, <laughs> yeah, sure, fine. That's because I don't want you to go to 10 decimal points, and you shouldn't need that calculator for uh, these questions. Um, most important is the known cases because there's probably very large numbers of cases that we didn't know about. And so those known cases are going to be the ones, these are people who show up in the hospital, they get diagnosed, et cetera. So if somebody doesn't have a really nasty case, it's highly unlikely they're going to be showing up and being tested. So that's uh, probably a real overestimation of the mortality rate. And that's going to be true for pretty much any of the viruses we talk about. So when we talk about the you know, mortality rate for any of these viruses, uh, if anything, the mortality rate's going to be a lot lower because there are probably a lot more cases that we just don't know about. And you can do some statistical analyses to try and get some ideas about that. But that's going to be true in a vast majority of cases. The virus we're going to be talking about today has about a 0.1% mortality rate, the measles virus. Um, but as it turns out, there are clearly many, many, many cases of measles. So that turns out to be then a very large number. Um, and then we can you know, talk about some of these other numbers as well. Um, as those of you who have seen my old exams probably know, I quite like these numerical answers because it's so easy to come up with other possibilities <laughs> for an possible answers. So. So yes, that's, it is all that matters to make my life easier, I know. So 
With that, um, just quick review again on our coronaviruses. Again, origin slash disease, basically common cold viruses with now the big exception of SARS and of course more recently MERS. The structure's got these beautiful crowns on the outside but otherwise pretty nondescript. The <coughs> genome on the inside is packaged as a helical form together with the nucleocapsid protein. We'll see that's true also for the paramyxo and rhabdoviruses today. Uh, binding and entry again is through this pretty standard fusion proteins. The replication is the interesting thing because the nested subgenomic RNAs. And we'll see that subgenomic RNAs are also a very important aspect of these negative strand RNA viruses as well. Uh, translation is you know, pretty standard and straightforward, five prime cap, et cetera. The difference is that frame shifting that takes place in the middle of the genome. And then releases, again, it's very much like the flaviviruses in terms of how these things are getting packaged and released. So again, we've shifted over to the negative strand um, for our RNA viruses. Um, the message here, um, particularly in terms of disease, lots and lots of viruses that cause some pretty nasty human diseases are in this negative strand RNA virus. Quite why that is, is not entirely clear. Uh, but there certainly are lots of them, which means we've studied um, quite a lot of them in detail. Um, in terms of disease, of course, measles and mumps are big deals and still becoming bigger. We'll spend some more time talking about those a little bit later on. Respiratory syncytial virus is a, not so much an emerging disease, but something which is um, a lot more people are becoming more <coughs> knowledgeable about. Sendai virus is sort of most of the things we know about those other viruses because they're really nasty to work with. We know from studying Sendai virus because it's something which is a lot easier to work with. And then rabies and vesicular stomatitis virus, sort of the same kind of thing. Rabies is a nasty disease and vesicular stomatitis virus is being a nice model system for the rhabdoviruses. In terms of key concepts, Again, subgenomic RNAs, but not the nested subgenomic as we had with the coronaviruses. These are made from the negative strand genome through a process that people call start-stop messenger RNA production. So it's a specific place that the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase will bind to the genome, make a short messenger RNA. That short messenger RNA in and of itself works, but it doesn't work terribly well unless you can add poly A tails to those messenger RNAs. And the way that happens is through something called stuttering. And basically it's the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase sitting in one place and recopying a template many, many times. And we'll see that this is very important for not just making those stable messenger RNAs, but also for some processes that are present in some but not all of these paramyxoviruses which is an RNA editing process. So what you see is not what you get. So if you look at the genome that you start with of the virus, and then you look at the messenger RNAs that you get back out, they're not always going to be exactly the same. Um, the other thing is alternative start codons, but we've talked about alternative start codons in a number of cases already, so that's not really specific to these viruses. Again, where do these guys come from? Probably the most important aspect about the you know, origins and where these guys come from is that this virus, or I should say this virion and this virion, even though they look extremely different relative to each other, are extremely similar at the molecular level. So it gives you a good indication that it's really all about the molecular level and not about the virion symmetry, which is most important in terms of understanding these viruses. They're negative strand RNA viruses with a single genomic RNA, so the, the mononega virales. Again, these virologists don't have much of a sense of imagination, which is probably good. It makes it easy to remember. Uh, then, again, we'll look a little bit at the structure. The paramyxoviruses themselves, kind of like a coronavirus. It's a blob you see in the electron microscope. So sometimes it's hard to tell whether you've got virions there at all. Um, the rhabdoviruses are much easier to detect that way. A little bit about binding and entry. 
Um, most important really here is replication and making of messenger RNA. So this one probably should have been highlighted in red. Um, then getting out is a pretty standard process. Again, these are enveloped viruses which are pretty standard. Talk about the mononega viruses or virales. Again, single negative strand RNA viruses. They all are produced by budding at the plasma membrane. All of their RNA dependent RNA polymerases or RDRPs, I'll use RDRP probably sort of more and more through the rest of the course. Um, they work on these nucleocapsids and that's important because nucleocapsid is genome plus the proteins that are associated with it. And so it's not just a naked RNA. Unlike the case for all of the positive strand RNA viruses that we've talked about so far, where it's just that RNA in of itself is infectious. So if you can get the RNA inside the cell, then you're good to go. On the other hand, all of these mononegaviruses, you have to have a really nice packaged nucleocapsid. And that's one of the reasons it's a lot harder to study these viruses, is because you don't have the way of making a nice RNA and then using that to transform. Um, and again, all of these mononegaviruses, including the fun viruses like Ebola and Marburg fever and so on and so forth that we'll be talking about next time, um, have the same kind of messenger RNA production start, stop. And so various different ways of making these out of your genome. We'll start talking about the structure of the rhabdoviruses because they're much more interesting in terms of their structures. This is a nice cartoon here from the, the viral zone. Uh, again, this is a great place to go and find some sort of images of structures and little definitions of the individual proteins. Again, an orthologous way of looking at these in addition to our textbook. So here we've got our nucleoprotein complex. So this is our RNA genome in green here with the N protein that's attached to it. So you always have genome plus your N protein that's associated with it. Together, because of course these are negative strand RNA viruses, they can't function by themselves. You bring in a negative strand into a host, the host can't do anything with it. Translation machinery can't do anything with it. So you have to make positive strand before you can make any proteins. How do you make positive strand? You have to have an RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Cells don't usually have much in the way of RNA dependent RNA polymerases, certainly not most mammalian cells. So it has to bring its polymerase or RNA dependent RNA polymerase with it. So that's always associated in the virion. The virion itself for these rhabdoviruses has a matrix protein, a lot like the matrix protein that we talked about last time for the coronaviruses, which is really serving as a sort of linkage between your glycoprotein on the outside. For rhabdoviruses, it's G. It's slightly different in the paramyxoviruses. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, and then the N protein, which is associated with your genome. The major rhabdoviruses are rabies. Hopefully everyone knows about rabies disease, nasty encephalitis if it's not treated, but one of the very first diseases for which there was a good vaccine. Um, Louis Pasteur was one of the very first people to start with those um, vaccines. One of the nice things, at least about the rabies vaccine, is that it works in a ipso post facto sense. So if you've been bitten by a rabid dog, rabid bat, rabid raccoon, you can get the vaccine afterwards and it still works um, and you can be protected. Otherwise, the encephalitis is really nasty. Um, I forget what the death rate is, but again, it's pretty high. Uh, because of that, most people work with VSV because it's a lot better behaved and doesn't cause encephalitis. Um, so it's really very much the, the lab rat of these kinds of viruses and even true for the paramyxoviruses as well. One of the reasons that people really like to use it, it is a, has a very, very broad host range, so it binds to and infects lots of different cells. And in fact, because of that, it's been very often used for gene therapy or parts of that virus have been used for gene therapy. The reason that it's got such a broad host range, of course, is that it has brought everything it needs with it, 
and it can bind to lots and lots of different cells. And so that's the G protein or the VSVG protein. And so that particular protein is used in many, many cases, what people also will call pseudotyping that we'll get back to um, in just a couple of minutes here. But that binding and fusion protein, the G protein in and of itself, means you can bind to and enter lots and lots of different kinds of cells. The paramyxoviruses, on the other hand, have also this package genome, and of course they're polymerase that's associated with it, but they don't have the nice, nice, uh, at least distinctive morphology of the virion. Um, they're very much more blob-like. The paramyxoviruses have two proteins that basically do the same job as the G protein in the VSV virus. That G protein is the binding and fusion protein, so all in one. Um, whereas for most of the paramyxoviruses, it's split up into multiple different proteins. So you have a hemagglutinin. The hemagglutinin is very similar to the influenza virus hemagglutinin that we've talked about before and we'll talk about again. Uh, binds to sialic acid, but it's a separate fusion protein. And that fusion protein, very similar to the other fusion proteins we talked about, conformational change at low pH. What happens then? You insert your fusion protein in the membrane. You get membrane fusion that takes place. All that happens together in the G protein in VSV. It's just one protein that's involved in that. Again, a matrix protein that then associates directly with your nuclear protein um, together with the rest of the genome. Diseases that we have from the paramyxoviruses. Measles probably has been around ever since large congregations of people have gotten together, um, forming cities, et cetera. So at least 6,000 years. There is a very good vaccine for measles virus. Nonetheless, there are probably on the order of a million infections per year. And this is you know, on, the, on a worldwide scale, um, despite the fact that there's a, a really nice vaccine. There's an extremely similar virus in cows. Um, anyone? Taken German, had German, Rind, so Rind's the cow, so the um, disease of the cow. Um, extremely similar virus, causes huge problems, again, particularly in the developing world. Probably measles came from the Rinderpest or maybe vice versa, again, like the camels. You don't know if we infected the camels with MERS, vice versa. Mumps is a similar virus in terms of how it functions, but nowhere near as similar at the molecular level as, as rinderpest and measles. Probably some of you have heard about the Nipah and Hendra viruses. These are new viruses that have been emerging in Southeast Asia. Again, probably from some of the bats and other wildlife which are there, the so-called zoonotic diseases. So these are viruses which are probably perfectly happy together with their hosts until we cut down the rainforest and then um, we end up running into these things or they run into us. Our lab rat for this is the Sendai virus and so a lot of the stuff again we'll be talking about for the rest of today has to do with the Sendai virus and what we know about how it's replicating. But first I need to beat on my vaccinated horse here. Um, get vaccinated. Please, 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 please remember the you know, all the people that are helping you out on the clicker questions, they're all within your one meter radius of how you can be infected. Uh, and measles is incredibly good. Um, I was just looking at the CDC website last night. They say, you know, if there are 50,000 people in a stadium and one person has measles, it will probably spread through most of that stadium. So it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, relatively low death rate, but it spreads so well that vaccination is really important. Before there was a vaccine, which was now 50 years ago, about 4 million cases in the U.S. every year, which is pretty mind-blowing in terms of the numbers. These were new cases, 4 million new cases every year. Because once you've been infected, the, your immune system is really good at, you know, at wiping out. So there's no symptoms the second time around. And so these are all new people. And so back at the envelope calculations, due to this measles vaccine in the last 50 years, probably 30 million children who otherwise will have died have lived. So very successful in terms of the vaccine. Yeah? What kind of vaccine is it? It's an attenuated vaccine. 
So you know, again, we've talked about this before. It's called the Edmonston. And at first, I thought it was from Edmonton, Alberta. But apparently, there was a patient in the name of Edmonston <laughs> whom they isolated this from. Uh, so that being said, so we went from 4 million pre-vaccine, which is admittedly was 50 years ago, to about 200 this year. So yes, you know, all hear about in the media, all these you know, measles, vaccine, uh, measles outbreaks. The numbers are ridiculously small. That being said, depending on which numbers you look at, 90 to 98% of these were unvaccinated. And most of them for religious, whatever exception reasons they wanted to have. Now, there are some cases where vaccination is not appropriate for kids. But um, for the most part, you know, probably 90% of these decided not to be vaccinated. Now, fortunately, it's only 200 cases. And again, the whole you know, football stadium thing, most of us are vaccinated. And most of us do a really good job of vaccinating our kids. Um, a lot of this data is from a, a nice news release that they had at the CDC. I just put the link down here, um, celebrating 50 years. Um, it was in December of last year, it was 50 years of the, the measles vaccine um, being introduced. We're unfortunately um, in this state over here, um, MMR, uh, the rate of vaccination that you have throughout the whole country. This is from a couple of years ago now. I tried to find some more recent data, um, unsuccessful last night. 90 some percent um, vaccination coverage, which basically means that those 200 cases stay at 200 and they don't move to 2 million. Um, so we have very good vaccine coverage. Unfortunately, there are a few states that don't do as well. Um, and in fact, this one over here, um, particularly next to that one over there, um, <clears throat> are some of the lowest in the country. And uh, this is, I think, somewhat concerning. Um, and if anything, this number has been going down a little bit in Oregon. So we're actually now under um, the 90%, which is really what we would like to have. I was interested to see that um, some of the places you wouldn't necessarily expect to have very high vaccination rates. Um, being completely stereotypical and biased, um, have actually very good vaccination rates. So um, quite why that is, is not entirely clear to me. Um, so, but yes, vaccinate, 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 vaccinate. And you'll hear me keep saying that through the rest of the class if you haven't heard enough already. Uh, that does remind me, by the way, I post quite a lot of, sort of pro-vaccination things on my film website, so the Edge of Life um, film website, so any of the new vaccination data, um, some things on there. So if you're interested in more of that, um, go and check that out, edgeoflifethemovie.com. Um, so which is really a Facebook page, but you know, don't tell anybody. <laughs> so let's look at a little bit more detail now at the paramyxoviruses. Um, again, they're enveloped viruses. Um, but they really kind of look like blobs. Uh, they've got their hemagglutinin, neuraminidase proteins on the outside. They're not as separated nicely as the crowns that you see in the coronaviruses, probably just because there are more proteins, a little bit more tightly packed um, in the membrane. If you get rid of the membrane and then just look at the genome package on the inside, you get these wonderful little snake-like structures. Um, these are all helical with the N protein bound to your nucleic acid. And so you can see here, well, maybe a little hard to see, but if you look closely, it's sort of a zigzag structure. That's because of the helical structure of your N proteins bound to your genome. Yeah? So it looks like the helical package is like spaghetti. Yeah, very much like spaghetti. So it's not a rigid helix. It's very floppy, and it's not unlike the coronaviruses. So yeah, and this is you know, this is multiple genomes here, and this is not just one genome of one particular from one particular virion. These are multiple here. Some of these paramyxoviruses, and we'll see this also for flu. This structure, the sort of roughly spherical blob, can also be really long and filamentous. Um, just because this is really a you know, spaghetti-like structure, as you pointed out nicely, in terms of what the, the nucleocapsid actually looks like. If you look at rhabdoviruses, on the other hand, 
These are much more regularly structured, but that mostly seems to do with the M protein and the M protein being much more stabilizing. The M protein basically forms a helix on the inside of your envelope. Um, how the end gets closed here at one end is not entirely clear, but again, we've got these sort of spaghetti-like um, form of the genome in the absence of the M protein. So the absence of the M protein, this is really pretty floppy. Unfortunately, they don't have a scale on here. Uh, this is about, you know, each of the diameters of this guy is actually just about the same as the diameter of this one. So they had the scale bar on here. I don't like the fact they've got these two um, separated from each other. So again, it's probably the M protein itself which is associating the helical form and then the envelope which forms on the outside of that, which is why these rhabdoviruses have these very similar structures. Hard to tell, of course, these blobs, what do they look like? So we draw these pretty cartoons. Note, not to scale. Um, <clears throat> for the paramyxoviruses, hemagglutinin, neuraminidase, some of these viruses have one protein, some have two basically do the same job as what you see in influenza, binding to sialic acid, cleaving that sialic acid, binding the sialic acid to get in, cleaving the sialic acid so you can get out and get released from the cell. Because remember, these things are budding at the plasma membrane. So if you're budding at the plasma membrane, there's going to be plenty of sialic acid around. And so you don't want to be stuck on the cell which is just produced. You want to be able to go out and find it somewhere else. Fusion protein, the big difference here is that Inside the virion, you have all of these other proteins that, of course, you need to replicate because you're not going to be able to do anything with a negative strand RNA virus genome once it comes inside the cell. Let's look at this hemagglutinin and neuraminidase protein in a little bit more detail. Um, again, it's not terribly different from what we've already talked about before. Hemagglutinin neuraminidase protein, again, a single transmembrane helix, binds up here at the top. Fusion protein, which has a fusion peptide which is blocked. Conformational change at low pH. These guys fuse with the membranes, pull them together. We've seen this happen multiple times now. The VSVG protein is really a combination of these two proteins together. And so it has both the sialic acid binding, most cases, it also has the neuraminidase activity and the fusion peptide all in one. And this is why it's such a great surface protein to use if you're trying to get your favorite bag of nucleic acid to bind to cells to be able to insert whatever's in there. And so that's what's called pseudotyping, is when you take a virus receptor binding protein and put it onto a different virus that would normally bind to something else. And very often that's going to be the VSVG protein that people use for that. I mean, people talk about pseudotyping in HIV, talk about pseudotyping in viral vectors that people are using for gene therapy. 90% of the time it's going to be this VSVG protein which is being used. Okay. Once you've got fusion, of course you release what's on the inside. It's not a naked RNA, it's this nucleocapsid. So it's the RNA bound to the N protein. This is um, an image here of just one of these. Remember correctly, this is Sendai in terms of the sequences here. No, I don't expect you to remember those sequences. Uh, but one of the things that you find is that the N protein binds to this genome one protein per six nucleotides. So it's a very regular helical structure. And again, helices are a great way to package because the interaction of this protein with that protein is the same as this one to that one, that one to that one, and so on and so forth. So it's extremely regular packaging that takes place here. Again, the problem is at the ends, well, the way that these viruses deal with that is that their genomes are always exact multiples of six. So there are no free nucleotides. Either at here, your OH, which is going to be at your three prime end, or at the opposite end where you have your phosphate, which is the five prime end. So these things are completely packaged, 
all the time with these end proteins. Yeah? So in cases where the drug like point three three is being administered to end the receptor, uh, they're often in a state of state which is take off or take off as cases of take off. Yeah, so the, the question is, you know, what would happen if you had insertions, deletions, et cetera? Here, what would happen? And the answer to that is usually those are going to be lethal mutations for the virus genome because it turns out, we'll talk about this when we talk about replication a little bit later on, you actually need the very specific sequence that you have at the N and C terminus. And so if you were to have that kind of cleavage you were talking about where it chops it up such that it's actually um, safe at that point, everything is packaged with the end protein, you're going to lose some of that sequence data, and that sequence data is critical for your replication process. So um, pretty much any insertions, deletions in these genomes, unless it's a multiple of six, which you can do in the lab, I find it hard to imagine how you would actually be doing that in an in, in vivo replication system. Uh, but it, that does work, and that's partly how people figure this out, is you're able to put in, say, 36 or 360 nucleotides, and it worked. Whereas if you put in something that wasn't a multiple of six, you had a lot of problems. Yeah? Yeah, so that's basically you know, how, how people figured this out, was that it had to be, had to be six. Um, one big thing which is different here, and remember the always packaged, um, your genome always has the end protein that's associated with it, and you can also think this is going to be a real problem because, well, how are you going to be able to copy the data if you think about it from that point of view, which is present in the genome? Well, the way that that works is the genome itself is wrapped around the outside of this helix as opposed to, be buried, as opposed to being buried on the inside. And so your RNA and RNA polymerase literally runs around the outside of this. Of course, this is not going to work for your messenger RNA because that's somehow got to get into the ribosome in order to be able to be translated. And there's no way you could do that. Whereas you could imagine the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase um, just zooming around on the outside of this. Fusion, again, oh, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> mentioned this before of membranes. Um, most of the time it's going to be the plasma membrane. Now, Sendai virus binds to sialic acid. Curiously enough, measles binds to some slightly different receptors rather than sialic acid. It has a hemagglutinin and uraminidase, but just sialic acid on the outside of the cell doesn't seem to be enough. You have to have some immune cell receptors, CD46 if you care, but it's not on the slides, so you don't need to remember it for the exam. Um, the H or HN, depending on whether you've got just hemagglutinin or hemagglutinin neuraminidase in the same protein, you have to have, and then the F changes, you've got trimers. But again, this is really standard kind of stuff that we've already talked about already. What's not standard, of course, is the genome, which is present on the inside. And so this is for the Sendai virus down here at the bottom. Again, what gets released in inside the cell is your nucleocapsid, so N plus your RNA, so it's not going to be this you know, nice thing. Of course, it's all curled up. And the L and P proteins, which are the viral polymerases, are coming in at the same time. So this is the genome down here at the bottom, 3 prime to 5 prime, because we're negative strand now, uh, have a leader sequence and a trailer sequence, and these are the sequences that are really critical for replication. It turns out that the leader sequence and the trailer sequence are identical to each other. And that really helps with your replication process. So as you start to change those, you have problems with replication. The other thing that you see here is that towards the three prime end, we have most of our structural proteins. And at the five prime end, we've got our non-structural proteins. L is that main uh, polymerase. N is our nucleocapsid protein. P, C, and V we'll talk about a little bit more later, but most important is P. It's a part of the replication process. 
M is matrix F and the hemagglutinin aminidase, which of course are fused together in sendai virus, excuse me, not sendai viruses in BSV, are together in one. What's interesting if you look at this sequence here is that you see between each of these individual genes some really interesting sequences. And the really important aspect of that is this whole stretch of U's. And it's usually only about five or six, which you have the end of one open reading frame. And then 20 or 30 nucleotides later, you have the start of the next open reading frame. So what does this mean? Um, if you look, just look at the messenger RNAs that are produced on infection, you have a messenger RNA for the N protein, you have messenger RNA for the PC and V protein, for the M protein, for the F protein, the HN protein. So how does this actually work? And the way the process works is that you have binding by your polymerase to the leader sequence at the three prime end. It will transcribe along through the N protein and then basically get to this energenic region and sit there and think about things for a little while. And that thinking about things for a little while, again, total other anthropomorphization here, but um, that stretch of views gets copied multiple times. And so that's how you're getting your poly A tail on your messenger RNA. So gives you the poly A tail. There doesn't seem to be a cap on most of these, and that's a different story. But uh, here, in some cases, but not all cases, the polymerase continues and will make the next messenger RNA, you know, starts again from that start position, gets to another one of these energenic regions, sits there, thinks about things for a while, makes a poly A tail, some cases will dissociate, other cases will stay on. And this process means that you end up with a lot more messenger RNA for all of your genes which are at the three prime end of your genome than you have down at the five prime end. Because you just have, say, you know, 10% each time, 100% of this, 90% of that, 80% of this, et cetera, et cetera. You weigh through the rest of the genome. And it's not exactly 10%, but that's basically the idea. So you end up with much more of your N and your structural proteins than you do of the non-structural proteins at the end. So people ask a little bit about this, and they talk about this a little bit in the textbook, is how do we know that it's this process? And basically the way that we know it's this process is that if you make a mutation in one of these genes in the middle here, that has a polar effect on everything downstream. And so if, for instance, you have a mutation here, and most of the mutations they talk about are UV-induced mutations, so these are pyrimidine dimers, um, U-dimers, because there aren't any Ts that you have in RNA genomes. So that is a block to the RNA polymerase. If you have a block to the RNA polymerase here, you end up with many more of these proteins over here and many fewer of these proteins over here. An alternative model, which is where the RNA polymerase could come in at any of these points, then having these mutations here would mean that you'd have just as much of these guys down here as you would in the absence of mutation. So um, that turns out, if you have a mutation, it has all these polar effects um, that are present down there. As I mentioned before, how do you go from transcription, replication, the three prime end of the genome, that's where you have your leader sequence, that's where the polymerase starts. And it has to have a very specific sequence, and so it gets cleaved in, we've clearly got problems. And the spacing is absolutely critical. So again, six nucleotides um, each time. That's because of the binding of this end protein. So you start at the three prime end and gives you the end. The L protein makes sort of a cap structure. It's not quite the same as other caps, which I say it's not you know, the same process. Um, we have stuttering, and then each of these um, sites is possible dissociation. This is basically what we had in the cartoon on the last slide. So that's everything down here at the bottom. Just yet another cartoon. We've got our L and P protein here, which is our polymerase starting at the three prime end of your nucleocapsid, which is released inside the genome. Again, it's all bound to your N protein. You leader sequence, make your <coughs> N protein messenger RNA. Some cases you'll make your PCV, some M, some F, some HN, and the, le the least amount of L at the very end um, when you're done. 
You've probably noticed that it says P, C, and V here. Turns out there are actually not just three different proteins, but in fact six or seven different proteins that are made from this. And that's because of differential translation that happens in here and RNA editing. So first let's just talk about the differential translation which happens. There are multiple different potential start codons in this messenger RNA. So depending on where you start, um, here's their C protein start. It's only 10 nucleotides away from the start position for the P, which is part of the polymerase protein. Um, 10 nucleotides means, of course, that you're in a different open reading frame because it's going to be threes. So the C protein has a completely different sequence than these um, P, V, and W proteins. So again, just starting in a different open reading frame. Turns out that these other ones, the C prime, the Y1, and Y2, are on the same frame. And so these um, proteins are similar here. They just have differences at their N termini. But between C and P, completely different sequences because they're completely different open reading frames. So this should sound really similar to what virus? Way back before the midterm? <laughs> Dim, dark, distant time? The message from outer space? The alien virus, Phi X174. So overlapping open reading frames. So um, here, and you do need the C protein as well as if you make mutations that wouldn't change the amino acid sequence of the C protein, but do change the amino acid sequence of the C protein, you have problems. So these are susceptible to, more susceptible to point mutations than you would otherwise find. The second interesting aspect is that towards the C termini, of these proteins, you have different amino acid sequences. And the way you get different amino acid sequences is not you know, different starts, because you started those at one end. But now, what seems to happen is that our same RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which when it gets to stretches of U's, makes poly-A tails, when it gets to stretches of G's, well, actually I should say stretches of C's, because this is what we have um, after it's being made, can add a couple of extra nucleotides here as well. And so it changes the frame of that messenger RNA. So the C termini of these proteins are slightly different relative to each other. So you've got changes in the N termini based on where you have translational start. You have changes in the C termini of your proteins due to changes in the polymerase, which is going to add a couple of nucleotides. So this is how the great case of you know, what you see is not what you get, because we have these changes that happen in terms of the sequence. So that's how you can get lots of different proteins. It turns out you have way more of the P protein than the C and the V proteins. Now the C and the V are the critical ones. Um, w, C prime, and Y don't seem to be that necessary for virus function. Um, but you do definitely need um, P, C, and V in terms of getting um, full virus function. How evolutionarily this happened, <laughs> no idea, but I think it's really fascinating. Um, so that's how we're getting our proteins. Um, how do you get genome? Because if you've got a polymerase, which is you know, chugging along here, and you know, every once in a while puts in some extra nucleotides, you know, poly tails, very different lengths, add some extra stuff in terms of your uh, changing reading frames at the end of your PC and P and C proteins, I should say. Uh, how can you get a genome, which is exactly six nucleotides, you know, multiples thereof, and none of this changing? And so what it turns out is, as soon as you get enough of the N protein, it binds to and changes the structure of the RNA in such a way that you don't get any stuttering anymore. So it's all dependent on the level of the N protein. If you have low levels of N protein, you make messenger RNA. Higher levels of N protein, you make first your antigenome RNA, and then you make your genomic RNA from there. 
and in the presence of high amounts of n, then you don't have stuttering. You just replicate from one end of the genome to the other. So it's all dependent on the amount of n protein. And we'll see this is true for pretty much all of the negative strand RNA viruses that we talk about for the rest of the term. It's really that switch between messenger RNA production and genome production is really dependent on the amount of the N protein, which makes perfect sense. Now, you make enough of the N protein, you're ready to encapsulate your genome, you're ready to go off and form virions and go and infect something else. How do you do that? Packaging, again, this is happening mostly at the plasma membrane, a few exceptions to that, but you have your you know, ribonucleoprotein complex, I would also just call your nucleocapsid here, which associates with the matrix protein and all of your virus envelope proteins at the plasma membrane. You have this budding process that takes place, the virion is released, probably partly due to the neuraminidase activity, which you have here, which releases it from whatever sialic acid is on the outside, and it's released, it goes off and finds another cell to infect. One of the things that you may notice here is that, you know, it doesn't, they're not labeled on here, but it's not just HA and NA, and particularly if you think about the paramyxoviruses, they have separate fusion proteins, and then the VSV virus has that G protein, which does everything. These guys are being expressed on the surface of the cell, and you're getting budding, which forms here by the individual vir virions. But these proteins are present on the outside of the cell anyway. So if there's another cell which is nearby, it can also fuse with that other cell. Because, you know, we've got HA, we've got our fusion proteins, so that can fuse with the next cell, and that's exactly what happens um, for syncytial formation. And you see this in a number of viral diseases. You get cells which are fusing to each other. This is probably where the genes came from that are important for placental development and syncytial formation that we have now in the development of placental mammals. And just a you know, reminder here, um, genome has to be a multiple of six nucleotides. So that's the paramyxo and rhabdoviruses. I was thinking about putting in another little vaccine video, but I'll probably do that uh, next time. Uh, but just thinking about the numbers of people infected by measles virus, one of the big problems, there is a great vaccine. The vaccine is not very stable and has to be administered on a multiple dose regime, and we're trying to fix that in my lab, if we possibly can. So with that, uh, we'll see you all on Friday.